I told my wife, I said, I know that we're taking a tremendous amount of risk here going into poverty for three or four years, but you know something? It's what needs to be done. We're not creating wealth here, but we are creating good. For more than 25 years, Craig and Tico worked as a debt buyer and bill collector. It was his job to analyze the billions of dollars available on debt markets, identify the best opportunities, and then get people to pay. Now, he and his business partner, Jerry Ashton, are still acquiring people's medical debt. But once they have it, they're doing something completely different with it. We're predatory givers. Our job is to take that money and go out and buy that debt, and unlike a collection agency, instead of pursuing it and chasing people down and on and on and on, it's gone. We put it into our debt graveyard. That graveyard, or debt cemetery, means that the debt is forgiven. A person no longer owes the money. In the past few years, Craig and Jerry have sent hundreds of millions of dollars there, freeing tens of thousands of people from medical expenses they'd owed in the process. They're doing it through a nonprofit called RIP Medical Debt, and they're taking aim at forgiving billions more. This is Crazy Good Turns. We tell inspiring stories about people who do amazing things for others. I'm your host, Brian Sabin. To start out this show, we should offer some context about the scale of medical debt in America today. Medical debt is the number one cause of bankruptcies in the U.S., and 15 million people go insolvent each year. 40% of Americans owe money for medical expenses. More than $100 billion of new self-paid debt, basically money that people, and not insurance companies, owe providers, gets created each year. Which is why, by the year 2022, some estimates indicate that patients will be responsible for more than $1.4 trillion in unpaid medical expenses. It definitely is a problem that continues to grow. That's Craig again. He started in the collection agency and debt buying industry in the early 1980s. His family owned a collections business, and so shortly after college, he fell into the work. His partner, Jerry, started a few years earlier. I sort of, at that time, and I still do to some extent, I see the bill collector as the good guy. Why do I say that? Because he's collecting on behalf of people who are not able to get money themselves. If you're a doctor, if you're a small business person, and somebody owes you money, that means you can't pay bills. That means you can't pay the wages. That means you can't meet your own obligations. You you gave a service, and for some reason or other, nobody's paying you. Over the years, I developed both a love and a hate relationship with the industry. I loved the effect of being able to make, bring back money for the creditor, and I didn't always like the methods that were used. Jerry said that his discomfort with business as usual within the industry caused him to approach the work differently. He eventually launched a business designed to help companies manage their bills better so they wouldn't have to use collection agencies at all. Jerry was giving a presentation on that subject at a business conference in the early 2000s when Craig first saw him. I said, who is that guy? I probably used the word not zany, but I call it zany now. (laughs) He was trying to tell all the collection agency executives how to run their business, how they could do a better job of keeping their customer's customer while still collecting the money. And we thought it was a crazy idea. I said, let's get out of here. Craig was between jobs at the time, and a while later, his phone rang. Jerry had heard about Craig's work and had wanted to meet him. Craig hadn't put together that the person he was about to meet was the same guy he'd seen at the presentation. I'm like, oh my God, it's Jerry. I didn't realize it was that guy. I'm like, oh my God. He said I was much more gracious. The two men clicked over lunch, and Jerry hired Craig at the company he was running at the time, CFO Advisors. The two say that they had complementary styles. Craig and I have sometimes been looked at and described by other people as the head and the heart of this organization. When I'm saying the head and the heart, we both have those in abundance. But I almost always act out of my heart. Craig, being more analytical and more, shall we use the phrase, responsible, sees it in a more linear fashion. Together, Craig and Jerry built a lucrative business. And by 2006, Jerry was able to retire. Craig, who's younger than Jerry and has five kids, moved on to other work, for IBM at first, and then some consulting later. The two men were brought back together by an unexpected circumstance, Occupy Wall Street. 
I was on the West Coast at a family gathering when Occupy began in September 17th of 20, uh, what was that, 2011. My, so long ago. And I saw it on TV, and they showed all these people in Zuccotti Park, and they had signs they were flashing around and making noises, and of course the TV commentator is belittling what they have to say and what they were doing. I thought it looked interesting. And being a former, once upon a time, uh, Navy journalist, I said to myself, I've got to go there and take a look and see if it's real. And when I went down to Zuccotti Park with my camera and my pen to see what was going on, I became very, very much tuned into the work that was going on. So I decided to join different working groups like student debt, media outreach, alternative banking, many different things like that. And when I did that, they noticed that there was a bill collector in their midst. Now, keep in mind, this is Occupy Wall Street. We're in the belly of the beast as far as they're concerned. So you wouldn't think that I'd be too welcome, except that whenever someone mentioned that they were being chased by a bill collector, I would tell them what to do. When they brought up their student debt, I would give them some consulting on what to do. And that's why I was invited to a meeting at which time they explored the idea with me of starting this 501c4 and buying debt and abolishing it. And when I saw all the work that was in front of them, I said, "Uh uh-oh, I've got to bring my buddy, Craig Antico, in on this because he was superbly equipped with his background in the debt-buying industry. Craig and Jerry say that they sit on opposite ends of the political spectrum. And Craig says that he isn't an activist. But Jerry was a friend, so he agreed to help. The two worked on a branch of Occupy that became known as the Rolling Jubilee. Here's MSNBC host Chris Hayes interviewing Occupy activist Astra Taylor about the effort. Are you guys just running basically a charity here and people give money, donate it, and then you forgive the debt and, you know, people will say, well, the people that are, whose debt is being sold five cents on the dollar, collectors have basically given up on it anyway, and can you even find the people whose debt you're forgiving? I mean, I think one of the beautiful things about this project is that it actually has concrete effects. It will, uh, the money raised will go to abolishing people's medical debt, and, and you know, often the, the credit card bills that they have to, they have to incur because they can't pay their medical bills, right? So there will be this very concrete effect on people as a consequence. The term Jubilee dates back to biblical times. The book of Leviticus describes how once every 50 years, any property taken for unpaid debts would be returned. Occupy discovered that that idea still resonates today. The group was able to raise more than $700,000 in two years and abolish almost $40 million in debt as a result. Those incredible multiples are possible because debt is sold for pennies in the dollar or less on these debt exchanges. But once an agency acquires that debt, they can attempt to collect it at full value. Craig says that his period working for Occupy was a transformative time. He started to see huge injustices in the system. One thing that's really hard to believe is that many of the rural hospitals throughout this country, none of the doctors are on insurance. They're all off insurance, so they're not covered. So those are out-of-network charges that you're going to get, and that's what's really surprising a lot of people. They thought they were covered. Their doctor said they were covered. They go to the hospital, get a surgery, and find that none of the doctors that are in that hospital are actually on a plan. And that just destroys people. That's where medical debt is destroying this country, is in the out-of-network surprise bills that people are getting. Another thing that impacted Craig and Jerry was the feedback they received from the people they helped. One of the letters that we received was from a 26-year-old single mother in Texas. And she sent us a picture of her and her two smiling children. Just gorgeous boys. Telling us that this was a gift from God and that she couldn't believe that there were people out there that would help like this and that she had such fears and worries about how she could possibly make it without some kind of help. And this was a a blessing. It came off of their credit because every time we buy a debt, we actually remove it from the credit report. And so she was just astonished and thankful. That's one important aspect of the work, how it affects your credit. An outstanding medical debt can lower your credit score by between 30 and 100 points. 
That means you'll spend more money on things like your credit card bills, car payment, and anything else that requires a loan. We're talking about the difference between a 25% credit card interest rate per year and a 12% interest rate. We're talking about the difference between a $2,000 auto insurance policy and $4,000 auto insurance policy. Occupy began to wind down the Rolling Jubilee in late 2013 for a number of reasons. Some felt that the effort wasn't doing enough to change the system. Others wanted to focus more exclusively on student loans. The organization decided to let their debt abolishment effort go. Greg and I looked at each other and said, this is too important to let stop. They actually were getting in $25,000 a month still at the end of 2013. And Jerry and I looked at each other and said, there's no way we can allow this to stop because we're helping so many people. So to keep the effort going, Craig and Jerry decided to launch RIP Medical Debt in 2014. But by that time, the work had already taken a toll on the two, particularly Craig. Jerry, who'd come into the effort from retirement, was already financially stable. But Craig took a significant hit to his earnings in order to do it. It was treacherous. We've had to sell our house. Kids didn't go to school for several years. My wife had to go to the hospital. It was, I, I'm not laughing. Um, if it wasn't for Jessica, my wife, uh, supporting this through putting the silverware in hock, doing everything we possibly could do to continue this effort, we would not be here. Without Occupy's microphone, RIP Medical Debt struggled mightily at first. In its first six months, they brought in just $3,000. Within its first year, the organization had drew in just $20,000. I had to talk to my reverend, my best friends, and I really questioned whether or not I was doing the right thing, whether or not it made sense to do this for others when you're putting yourself into complete peril. Is it right? Am I being a provider my wife would say, you're not being a provider. And I'm saying, you're exactly right. (laughs) But we both decided that we would do this. Well, she didn't know it would get to this. This would not have happened without the guts and determination of our spouses. We love this. I don't care if I'm about to fall off the earth. I'm going to do it. Remember what I said earlier that Craig and I were the head and the heart? Well, sometimes (laughs) sometimes we reverse that. (laughs) So you've heard a lot of heart out of Craig there. Uh, What are we doing? What we love to do. And there's an old saying, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's been true for us. What I want the listener to understand is that in no way are we victims. In no way are we feeling that we gave up something or that the world owes us something for what we were doing. We did what we wanted to do. We knew the cost. We paid the cost. And It just so happens that Providence is returning that to us. Providence, it turns out, came in the form of a comedy news show. Debt buying is a grimy business and badly needs more oversight. Because as it stands, any idiot can get into it. And I can prove that to you because I'm an idiot and we started a debt buying company. That's John Oliver, host of the HBO show Last Week Tonight. In June of 2016, Oliver did a segment on the debt buying business. And he did go so far as to launch his own company in the industry. We called it Central Asset Recovery Professionals, or CARP, after the bottom-feeding fish. With that company, which Oliver says cost him $50 to launch, he was able to get onto the exchanges and acquire nearly $15 million in debt, owed by about 9,000 people. So, we bought it, which is absolutely terrifying, because it means if I wanted to, I could legally have CARP take possession of that list and have employees start calling people, turning their lives upside down over medical debt they no longer had to pay. There would be absolutely nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that absolutely everything is wrong with that. Instead, Oliver called on RIP Medical Debt to make those debts go away. So instead of having the file sent to CARP, we had the seller send it directly to a non-profit organization which specializes in forgiving medical debt with no tax consequences for the debtor. From there, things accelerated quickly for RIP Medical Debt. They were featured in the New York Times and a number of other news outlets, including some that got involved. 
News stations in Seattle, Los Angeles, and Dallas joined forces with other broadcasters to abolish more than $40 million in debt, and the work spiraled outward from there. The debt sharks in Pensacola, Florida, abolished almost $3 million of medical debt for their community. And it has a very big percentage of their community is military. So the Minnesota nurses reached out to us and they said, okay, this is what we have available. How much debt can we buy? We located about $1.9 million for about 1,800 families. And they said, we'll take it. Well, one other thing. There's a foundation called the Jefferson Foundation that wants to bring this to schools across the country. There are some major philanthropists here in New York that are bringing their own kids into this to show them how to be philanthropic. We have doctors starting campaigns. We have a group of the most prominent chief medical officers and doctors in L.A. form their own campaign to end medical debt. We have this happening with unions across the country. Melvin Brewing in Wyoming reached out to us and they said, we like this idea. We want to adopt you as a charity. Each pint that a person drinks of your IPA from Melvin Brewing, $500 of medical debt gets abolished. That is powerful. Now, this is the first occasion in which you can actually drink away somebody else's medical debt problem. So far, RIP Medical Debt has abolished more than $120 million in debt. They've helped more than 60,000 people in the process. One of those individuals owed $251,000 on their own. Craig and Jerry say that their goal is to forgive a billion dollars by the end of this year. Think of what it really takes to get rid of a billion dollars of the medical debt. It takes about 12 to 14 million dollars. There are individuals in this country who could write that check out out of petty cash. There could also be 14 million people who will send us a dollar. So we know that, yes, a billion dollars is possible. Part of what makes RIP medical debt unique is how they go about forgiving these debts. Technically, if a debt holder were to simply cancel a person's debt, that person could be taxed on the portion of the bill they didn't have to pay. Each year, the government, quote-unquote, forgives $110 billion of debt for students. Guess what happens, though? The students get a 1099-C that says they just got $110 billion of income from the government because their debt was forgiven. RIP Medical Debt makes sure that that doesn't happen. They are also able to direct donations toward helping a specific group of people. For example, children, or someone who suffered from a specific ailment, like breast cancer. This year, RIP Medical Debt has already forgiven more than $25 million in medical debt held by veterans, and have a goal of doubling that by Veterans Day this November. RIP is also conducting ongoing studies under the effect that these forgivenesses are having on people in the real world. We even have MIT, University of California, Berkeley, UCLA, and University of Chicago doing impact studies on our debt forgiveness. Every time I buy a debt portfolio, I do a randomized control trial on them so that I can tell which which people need the help the most. One limitation that the organization does have right now is that it's unable to link one person with another. So if you wanted to nominate a person or a family for help, right now you couldn't. But they're working to change that. All the debt that we've abolished thus far has been a random act of kindness. A donor gave money, we went and bought a portfolio of accounts, and we abolished it. And then those people that were in that portfolio, maybe 10,000, 50,000 people, got letters from us. However... There are a tremendous amount of people that come to us and ask for help. So we started a debt registry. We're eventually going to get to the point where we can abolish particular people's debt. Craig emphasized that it could be a long time before they reach that point. In the meantime, a single donation of a few hundred or a few thousand dollars can provide relief that's a hundred times greater. I would say that that's a pretty good investment on anybody's part. See, we're competing with... A lot of companies say, you invest in me, and I'll, bring, I'll make you a lot of money. No, we say, you invest with me, and we'll give you a social change, a social difference. We'll make a difference in people's lives. You can count that in a different way. It's a different accounting system for it, but it's there. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. 
Go to crazygoodturns.org to learn more about RIP Medical Debt. We'll also have a link where you can donate. You can submit your ideas for people or organizations we should feature on an upcoming show by emailing us at hello at crazygoodturns.org. Stay connected with us between shows by following us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at forward slash crazygoodturns. Our show is audio engineered by Stephen Key. Music supervision and mixing by Score Score in Los Angeles. A special thanks goes to Megan Hanlon, and I'm your host, Brian Sabin. You have to believe in something greater than yourself to actually be able to do it. I don't think there's any way that that we could have done this without believing that these miracles would happen. We don't expect miracles. We require them. (laughs) 